Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Sridatta. I've been with Solution Street for seven years now, and um, I'm currently working on the Deltic project. Uh, today, I'm going to do a presentation on Elasticsearch. Again, a little disclaimer here. I'm in no way an expert in Elasticsearch. I chose this topic for my um, um, tech technical goals this year, and so here I am doing a presentation um, on Elasticsearch. So let's start at the very beginning. What And today's agenda is I'll talk a little bit about Elasticsearch, the architecture, the what, why, and how, the inner workings of Elasticsearch, and then I'll do a couple uh, examples and demo to show uh, to get a little feel about um, Elasticsearch, and then finally questions. And it doesn't mean you have to save your questions till the very end of the presentation. You can uh, at any time uh, in the middle of the presentation chime in and ask your questions. What is Elasticsearch? Elasticsearch is, a, is an analytics and full text search engine. Um, it, most applications oftentimes what they do is they, they, they use um, Elasticsearch to enable search functionality in their applications. Um, so you could have an e-commerce website or a blog with multiple blog entries. You want your users to search through that data, products, categories, or even blog posts. So then you hook your application to Elasticsearch so you can um, search through products or anything that is of interest to you. Elasticsearch is very good at combing through tons of data. It is very good at full text search. It's, it's something like um, uh, what you see on a Google search. It does um, auto completion, um, fixing typos, and then handling um, um, uh, fixing typos and then auto completion. And it also, that term escapes me. Um, uh, it does relevant searches too. So it's it's not just um, searching that it does, there's other things too that it can do, like it can uh, present pretty pictures, uh, draw pie charts, uh, line charts, bar charts, et cetera. It does monitoring, uh, wherein it goes through your CPU and memory usage and then see um, when you're about to hit the roof and then it can alert you saying that, okay, you are uh, reaching uh, this threshold, so it's time for you to probably uh, um, uh, add more service to your architecture and things like that. And it can also um, do anomaly detection wherein, say supposing um, you see 5,000 users visiting your website on, a, on any given day, and then suddenly that drops to 100. So there definitely is an issue. So at that point, it detects that uh, behavior which is out of normal, and then it it would alert you via a text or an email saying that okay, there's something wrong. You need to take a look. Um, it does uh, uh, access logs and um, error logs, um, search, then metrics, and then um, it also does reporting. Therein, uh, it can uh, generate reports periodically, and then at every uh, certain interval, it can send you reports. Or it, you can also add rules to say that, okay, I don't want to see uh, these reports every so often. I just want to see a report when something goes wrong or when something's doing brilliantly well, um, things like that. Uh, so Elasticsearch, it's written in Java. It's built on Apache Lucene, and it, it does um, real-time search and analysis, and it provides a RESTful API um, as JSON over HTTP. Um, like we discussed, what can Elasticsearch do? It can analyze and do full text search. It can query structured data and perform aggregations. It can use machine learning to forecast sales uh, based on historical data. Say you have an e-commerce site that does well, um, and then uh, come Black Friday or Christmas time, the sales, they go through the roof. So m machine learning can... Um, learn the pattern, observe the pattern, and then predict that, okay, going by your past history, the sales have been so, like this. So you can expect a spike here or here, depending on how it has done in the past and things like that. And we've talked about anomaly detection and alerting, and then it can make pretty graphs using Kibana. 
So when we hear about Elasticsearch, we hear these terms being thrown around like ELK stack and Elastic stack. So the E is the Elasticsearch, L is the Logstash, K is Kibana. So these three are often used together. And these three are uh, developed by the company Elastic, Elastic, which was formerly known as Elasticsearch. So these are open source software products that are often used in combination um, together. So that's why it's called Elasticsearch. The Elasticsearch and, um, sorry, the Elastic Stack and the Elastic Stack are often used interchangeably, although there is a slight difference between ELK Stack and Elastic Stack. ELK Stack is where Elasticsearch is the heart of um, the, this architecture. Kibana is uh, an analytics and visualization platform. So you can imagine that as uh, an Elasticsearch dashboard where you can um, search through data and then make pretty graphs like pie charts, line graphs, or bar charts, uh, or even um, geographical charts. And Logstash is more a tool that that processes data, transforms data, filters data, and then feeds it to Elasticsearch. So data comes through Logstash into Elasticsearch, and then Kibana is a web interface that interacts and queries data, and then shows the results to the user. And here is Elasticsearch, where there's a couple more characters that you see in addition to E, L, and K. There is the um, XPAC, and then there is Beats. XPAC is nothing but um, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it adds more features to Elasticsearch. Um, then, it's a, then it adds more features, it's, 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 it's authorization and authentication, wherein um, you, you have a module that would um, integrate with either LDAP or Active Directory and then do authentication for you. And then, of course, authorization, reporting, um, monitoring, alerting. You can have machine, a machine language module integrate with this so it, uh, it learns the patterns and then starts predicting or forecasting or even alerting you. And um, there is another feature called Elastic SQL. So people coming from a, a relational database background, they're not very comfortable using um, DSL, which Elasticsearch provides, which is a, a domain-specific language, a query language. It's, it's, pattern, it's like JSON, where you pattern your queries in a JSON format. So it is verbose and sometimes a little hard to get used to. So what Elasticsearch SQL provides is a way for people to write their queries in SQL, and then that is fed into uh, Elasticsearch SQL, which then transforms that to DSL. Uh, DSL and um, uh, queries Elasticsearch and gets the data back and then uh, forwards it to the client. And there is Graph, a component. It, it's all about relationships in your data. So when you go on a website and then you uh, search for product, it, it recommends you uh, related products. Okay, this is something you might be interested in or people have bought this, also bought this. Things like that. Or if you go on Spotify and listen to a particular uh, artist or an album, then it provides recommendations saying that, okay, this is somebody or another album that you might be uh, interested in listening to and things like that. So it, it, it looks at uh, an uncommon, it, it's not that if you are listening to uh, an artist and then that artist is popular, another artist who's um, who's also popular doesn't mean that you would be interested in listening to him. So it's not just popularity that dictates those recommendations. Um, it's it's uh, a relevance factor. Like if you go out and um, ask the first 10 people that you see if they use Google, most likely the answer would be yes. But that doesn't give you any, any information about the commonality in all those 10 people. But if you go out and ask another set of 10 people if they used Stack Overflow and they all said yes, then there is something common uh, among those 10 people. And the common thing is that they are in some way related to programming. So it's that uncommonly common factor that it looks for and then ties um, things together and proposes recommendations or suggestions. And then um, the other thing that it does is, yeah, Elasticsearch SQL. 
And Beats, Beats is nothing but um, it's a it's a collection of data shippers, lightweight agents that would bring in data into Elasticsearch. There's many kinds of Beats like Packet Beat, File Beat. File Beat is very good at reading um, log files and then turning them into log uh, entries and then feeding it to uh, Elasticsearch. There is Audit Beat, Packet Beat, Metric Beat. Metric Beat is good at uh, reading system metrics like CPU usage, memory, things like that. Yeah. So if you compare the two stacks, is one a superset of the other? Like does the elastic stack have everything the elk stack has? But yes, yes. Okay. elastic stack is a, uh, stack is a superset of the elk stack. Okay, for those who didn't hear that properly, so is Elasticsearch a superset of the ELK stack? And the answer is yes, because ELK stack is purely those three components where there's Elasticsearch, log, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, while Elasticsearch, Elastic stack has uh, a few other components like XPack and Beats. Um, why Elasticsearch? Elasticsearch is very easy to deploy. Little configuration needed. It scales very well. It's, it has a very easy to use API, and it also comes with um, modules for integrating with other scripting and programming languages. It's got good documentation. It's actively maintained. There is a big community that you can ask your questions, etc. And more than anything, it's free. It's open source. Um, so the common architecture typically is that you would have an application server that interacts with a database, and then when a user types in something, requests for a page or something, the application server would forward that request to the database, gets the data, renders the page, ships it off to the browser. Now, how would you incorporate Elasticsearch within this architecture? So you would want your application server talking to Elasticsearch. So now when a user enters a search string, you could ask the database and then get, get, get the results to the user. But databases are not good at full text searching. So there comes Elasticsearch. So when you have Elasticsearch in your architecture, your app server talks to Elasticsearch, gets the information, and gives it to the user or the client. But that would also mean, so if you have your architecture in place and then later, Somewhere down the line, if you introduce Elasticsearch, that would mean you will have to have all that data copied over to Elasticsearch. There is data replication, but there's no way around it because databases simply won't do it. So you write a script, get all that data into Elasticsearch, and then do your querying. So does Elasticsearch talk to the database or, or the Elasticsearch, I mean, once you have all that data that's already there in the database, you need a script to uh, transfer that data to Elasticsearch. After that, as and when data keeps uh, mo getting modified on the database, you, you can also have a module on your application server that updates the database and also sends a request to update Elasticsearch. Um, as time goes by and then your application evolves, there's many more visitors um, hitting your app, and then there's more products that get added, more code that gets added, so it becomes difficult. So you will need these additional modules like the metric beat, that's the metric beat uh, monitoring your system usage. And then there is file beat that is reading your application logs and then processing to see what the API uh, response times are. What, where errors are happening because your code base is so big that it, you need something like that to keep uh, to, to tell you that, okay, these are the areas that need uh, improvement and things like that. So at that point, um, and then you can also send events like sales, phone calls, chat transcripts, um, things like that. So when that comes into picture, you need log stash. So you can have your app server doing all these terrible things. Your app server has one job, and that is to uh, whatever business logic that is involved is what it needs to handle. Aside things like, okay, I need to get all this data into Elasticsearch, sales, events, all these things. So they can be taken care of. And if you clutter your application server with logic that says, okay, um, now while you do this, you also make a note of, um, you also transform all this data and then put it in to uh, Elasticsearch. So when you do all those things, when you write your own code, it's prone 
um, to be buggy. So that's why you ship it off to these um, other uh, products like Logstash. So it can take care of um, having all that information um, transferred to Elasticsearch. And then, of course, Kibana could be installed on another instance, and that can interact with Elasticsearch to get the data and um, do um, visualizations. Um, so at the heart of Elasticsearch is nodes and clusters. What is a node? A node is nothing but a server. It contains data. And a cluster is a collection of nodes. So when you have all these nodes, there is one node that would be a coordinating node in the sense that when Elasticsearch receives a request over HTTP, there is one, any, any of these nodes is equipped to handle that HTTP request. So if it's node B that's handling it, so it, it takes the request, it forwards it to the other two nodes. And it does that through the transport layer. So it, it, it only interacts with external clients via HTTP. Internally, it uses the transport layer, forwards that request, gets the data, compiles it, collates it, and then gives it back to the um, client. Say supposing you have an index. Um, again, there is a node. It has data. And the way it has this data stored is in an index. An index is nothing but a collection of documents. And a document is a single unit of information. So if there is an index that is very big, there is no way that it can be um, handled by one node. What do you do? You split the index into multiple pieces. And each of these pieces is called shard. And sharding comes to the rescue when you cannot have huge data be on one node. So here in this case, if you, if you have a cluster with two nodes, and those two nodes have 512 GB of memory, then, and your index, if it is one terabyte, there's no way each any of these two nodes can handle that information, so you split it down. In this case, it's split down into four shards with 256 GB each, and these shards can then be accommodated on these two nodes, two shards each. So sharding um, addresses two issues. One is it splits and scales. So the one good thing, or one big thing that's going for um, Elasticsearch is that it scales and scales beautifully. So now when you have data that is exponentially growing, all you have to do is add additional nodes to your cluster and you're good. Because Shadi comes to the picture, it just splits this data and then distributes it all across uh, different nodes. And the other thing too that sharding helps with is performance. Because if you have multiple nodes and all these nodes are participating in searching, you are paralyzing that operation, and in turn, making things go faster. Um, here is your cluster. Uh, like we discussed before, there is an index one that is one terabyte, uh, uh, terabyte big, and it's split into four shards, and then each of these, there's two shards on each of these nodes. Um, and when you, when, you, when you do sharding, there is a primary shard. Then again, hardware can fail, software can be buggy, things can go wrong all the time. So you have all these shards, you have all these nodes. So supposing one of these nodes crashes, there is no way you can get to that data. So it's important that you replicate your data. So each of your shards is need to have replicas. So the one that is being replicated is called a primary shard, and the one that's replicated is called a replica shard. Uh, shard. And these together, the primary shard and the replica shards together is called a replication group. And when you, shard, when you perform replication, you don't have your primary shard and your replica shard reside on the same node, because what if that node crashes? You have no primary, or you're, that, that, that bit of data is lost. 
So, um, so when you have shards, you have your primary shard and your replica shard residing on different nodes. And when a request comes in, the primary shard um, will, will address it, will take the operation, it validates the operation, it completes the operation, and then it forwards that request to replica shards. And the replica shards, uh, shards take care of that, and then they provide their response back to the primary shard, and the primary shard is the one that reports back saying everything went well. So when, an, when, when you have to add a new document, it comes through to primary shard first, primary shard completes that operation, then says, okay, you need to add this document to, your, um, to, your, to the shard, and then the replica shards go ahead and do that, get back, say, uh, they get back to primary shard saying that all is well, and that's when um, the primary shard reports back saying, Everything's good. So in this um, diagram, you have node A, node B, and as you can see, primary shards and replica shards are not on the same node. And when it re receives a request, it forwards it to the replica shards, and then they get back to the primary shard. The primary shard, again, um, compiles a response and sends it back. So when you're searching, did you have questions? Yeah, so so a shard is a portion of the full index table. Yes. Okay. And there is um, a shard cannot reside on two different nodes. And when you shard, a document cannot be a part of two different shards. It has to be wholly present on one shard. And a shard needs to be wholly present on one node. But if I have multiple nodes, mm -hmm. it's not architected so that multiple nodes can act as the primary retriever of that shard's data. There's always going to be one each. There's always going to be a primary shard A somewhere on one of the nodes in my set. Mm -hmm. So then I would then have a replicant of that primary shard somewhere else on some other node. Right. Okay. So that's okay. All right. And then. It's not that only primary shards can handle requests. Replicas can participate fully, actively in a search. So it's not that if there is a node with a primary shard that failed, the replica can just as easily handle that. If I've got four shards involved, it isn't such that, any, that each node has to have all four shards in some way? No. Okay, so one so it depends. Have three, another could have three, another Right. So by default, when you create a, um, a, a node, if you don't mention, there's five shards that get created for that index. So if you don't have five nodes, there is no way that each of your shards is present on a different machine. So multiple shards of the same index can reside on a node. It's just that the replicas and the primary shards are not on the same node. Um, so if you look at searching, so the client uh, issues a search query, Elasticsearch searches through the data, and then sends the results back. It's as simple as that. But if you look closely, um, there's different nodes in your cluster, and then there is, you can assign one to be the master. So that one would be handling all the requests all the time. But then if you don't, any of these nodes is equally capable of handling that request. So you send the query to one of the nodes, and that, is, that acts as a coordinating node, forwards the request, gathers the information, sends it back to the client. So when you are querying for a particular index, how does it know that, how does Elasticsearch know that it resides on this particular shard? So that's where routing comes into picture. So when you create your index, and you're given a certain amount of shards. Midway through, there is no way you can change the number of shards. Because if you do that, then what happens is search will be messed up. Why? Because if you, if you add a document to a shard, to an index, say, it'll have to decide which shard it's going to put that document on. It cannot be that you have five shards, but then these two shards are overloaded with information and then the other three shards are just sitting pretty. 
there is an algorithm that goes, that is computed. Um, there's a formula that's computed and that decides what shard this new document is going to go reside in. So it, it takes the doc ID, it um, goes through a hash, uh, a routing hash, and then it gets a number. And that number is divided by the number of shards on that index. And then the bottom of that will be a number, and that is the shard number that this document is going to go state in as, state in. So you have your document saved on different shards. And then down the line, if you think, no, five shards is not enough, let me go make that seven. And what happens is there is a document that went through this routing formula and got saved on, say, shard two. Now you have seven shards, and then you're looking for this document that you saved on shard two, but then the routing formula changed. The total number of primary shards is now seven. So the number, the shard number where it is saved as is different. So it goes and looks in maybe shard four or three and then says, no, there's no information here. So that is the reason why once you have an index created, you cannot change the number of shards. If you have to, then you'll have to delete that shard, create a new shard with whatever number of shards you create a new index with whatever number of shots you want and move this data from the previous index to the new index. Um, so that's about the architecture and any questions so far? Um, so let's take a look at some examples I have. Um, Elasticsearch installed, and then of course Kibana. Um, there are some APIs that um, you can make use of to see, explore what your cluster is like, create documents, indexes, and then um, have um, search capability on them. Let's let's do. There is again, we use HTTP words to get and add and update information. So we use the words get, put, post, delete. Etc. Um, let's see what. So there is this cat API that lets you explore what your index or what your cluster is like. So, so I'm so I'm using this um, API and inquiring about the health of my uh, cluster. And when I say we, it's verbose. So. I'll, Is that better? So I see that my cluster, there is um, the status of my cluster and then how many nodes I have, what data I have, how many shots I have, primary, um, and then if there's any unassigned ones. So I can use, um, um, query param h equal to, and then just say, just view uh, ones that I want to see. So, and then do this. So my cluster, by default, your cluster would be named Elasticsearch. And then when you have nodes configured, they would automatically go join the cluster Elasticsearch. So not that you would have your development and your production environments on the same uh, together, but it's always a good idea when you have your production cluster installed, give it a name. Don't just go with what the default is, because if you, if supposing your development nodes are added there, then they would automatically join Elasticsearch cluster and then it will all be messed up. So the health of a cluster um, can be green, yellow, or red. So when it is green, it's all good, wherein you have your shards, your indices, and everything is, and all of them are participating in search, and data is just fine. When you say yellow, because this is only just one node, then there is only one node, there is no way I can have my, there is no way I can have replica shards, because there's, they're, they're all going to be primary shards, because there's replica shards and primary shards, they don't coexist on one node. So then there is a failure there is no way my search is gonna be accurate. So that's the reason the health of my cluster right now is yellow. Um, and then there is a total uh, of one node. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, I can go view my indices. So right now, I have, yeah, these are the default ones that came with um, Kibana when I did the installation. And I have one index. Um, I have um, imported some um, data into one of my index indices, which is uh, this. And because I don't have replica shards, the health of my index is yellow, whereas everything else is green. Um, I could also go see nodes. Can we do that? There is only one node, and it's the master node, and that's my machine. And if you go see allocation, you see there's four shards, and then the disk usage, and then what the host is, what the IP is, what the node name is, and there's unassigned, it's there is one shot that is unassigned. Um, let's go ahead and create um, an index. So I could do um, something like this. So I'm just creating an index right here. So the response is that it acknowledged it and it said that everything went fine. So I would go and then do the product and then it gives me the information about the index that was just created. So when you create um, an index, it's you can create it with um, a name right here, and um, it's the provided name is product, and the number of shards is one. The number of replicas is um, one. And let's put um, let's add a document to this. The way we do it is we do, that's the index. I'm adding a doc. I can give an ID right here and then say a document is nothing but a JSON document. So you just do put your data like so. So when you do this, you're saying that this is all the metadata fields that the document has. This is the actual, um, the actual document is not here, but the index is, it belongs to product, the type is doc, the ID is one, because I've mentioned one here. If I did not, then Elasticsearch would generate a UUID and then assign it to the ID. The version is one, it's just got created, the number of shards is two, and they're all successful, not failed, things like that. So next, if I wanna post, There is another way to create, um, to add a document. If I do this, then another document got added, except I did not give it an ID, so it just generates an automatic ID and then a UUID and gives, assigns it to that. Now let's go see what um, search is an API that you use to query um, information from um, an index or, um, yes, yeah, from an index. So it took 129 microseconds to process that and it did not time out. The number of shots is one. The number of successful ones is one. It did not skip any, did not fail. And then hits is, hits object is the one that gives you the results. So the total results is two and the relation was equal to. Um, so we'll come to max score. It's, it's a relevant score that it assigns to the search results. So by default, it's one. And then these are the search results. So this is one document with source um, 
first name, Sri Lata, last name Kandi, and uh, the score is one for both of them because there's, we do not do any matching here. And the type is document, the ID here in this case is one. The ID in, in, in the case of the second document is something that was already generated. Um, so the way, so once you add a document, you can update it by using the update API. You can just, you, you can just say, okay, put one here. Um, so you've already put this document one there. So if you want to update it and then say add something here, you could just go say age. I wish. So you've updated it. So when you do this, what is happening is that document as a whole was removed and then another one was added. So with the same information and then there is that additional information that I just added. You can do that. So when the documents are really big, you cannot afford to do that, wherein you say, okay, I have all this information that's already there in the document, and then this additional piece of information. Instead, you could do um, an update, and then you can say, doc, Um, okay, so this is, so it was version one when I created it. When I added my age, it was version two. Now the third update makes it version three. And here I only added, um, let's search that and see that, yes. The document has person last name from the first time that I added it, age from the second time I updated it as a whole, and sex female is the part that got added or updated with this operation right here. Um, you could also do something like scripting, where um, you could just say, Where you can go say H is PPX is an object that gives a handle to the source of your um, document. I could say that is overnight I aged 10 years. Wow. Transcript is. I am, okay. I don't feel age. Um, Yeah, this is something that's um, a little difficult with respect to the JSON, remembering the options and then the keys and all that. So if so, if I don't have the if I don't remember what the age was previously, um, I could just say and what if if I wanted to up the price of my product by ten dollars, I could just go say, um, okay, here is my age, and then just incremented by ten or something like that. Here is my price incremented by ten or something like that. Um, updated by, and there is something called absurd too, wherein I could just say, if there is an attribute in the document, then it would just, um, ignore that, or if it isn't there, then it is added to the do document. And there is update by query um, API, wherein you could write a query, and then whatever 
documents satisfy that query would be updated. Um, let's say updated by I would say so I've updated my document again and I can I'll go update a, another record um document missing exception. Okay, I forgot that Arthur's document doesn't have an ID. I mean, it has an ID, but then not one that I gave it. Um, so let's fetch that ID right here. Then I updated it, and now I have this um, information right here. I can go search Records right here using a query that says match um, about has run a colon. Yeah, there is. So it brings up Arthur's record because um, the attribute about has the word run in it. Um, so the score is actually a relevant score. So when you put your um, search string, there is a couple rules by which the relevant score is computed. So it could be proximity. So when you say, I'm looking for um, something like two So if you enter a search string that has two words in it, the way it matches it is it does a full body, um, full text search. So those two words need not be right next to each other. Say, if you found a document where these two words are right next to each other, that document re, uh, is, has a higher score than another document that has these two words, but they're separated by other words. So there is um, an algorithm that is used by Elasticsearch by default, which looks for term frequency, inverse document frequency, and the length of the field. So there's, so if there is a document with 5,000 words and the search term that you entered, say, matches 100 words in, that, in the list of 5,000 words, then the term frequency is high, as opposed to another document that only has 10 words that match in that, in that field. And that is, so, so the document that I first mentioned there it has 500 matches would have a higher score than the other document, even though both of them end up being matches. And the other thing is there are these words, the stop words is what they call them. Uh, words like and, the, off, is, they occur liberally in all these documents. So if you were searching for a word in, and then it has say 10,000 occurrences in a document that is 20,000 words big, then it doesn't really mean anything. So that's where they take inverse document uh, frequency into consideration. So if, if, if a word, again, with stop words, it does make sense, but with real words, actual words, it doesn't really make that much sense, but they go with that algorithm anyway. Um, in the end, it, it evens out with the term frequency, inverse document frequency, and also the length of the uh, field, if you take that into account. Say if your field is 100 words long, and um, you have 10, or maybe if the word is, say, uh, 10 characters long, and the searching that you've entered matches five uh, characters there. So that is a better match than if your word was, say, uh, 20 
or maybe even uh, six um, characters long, and then there's uh, five characters. Um, the search string was five characters. So, um, and then there is other algorithms too that that can be used, but by default, this is what um, Elasticsearch uses, which is term frequency, inverse document frequency, and um, um, the length of the field. What happens when when you create an index is it goes through an analyzer. An analyzer is something that has a, a filter, a tokenizer, and a tokenizer filter. What the tokenizer does it 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 it, it breaks that field into words, um, either by white space or by commas or any delimiter, and then it makes a list of words. And then when it goes to the tokenizer filter. There, there are many kinds of filters. A standard filter would just um, would just convert all these words into lowercase words, and then these the list of these words, these words would then get stored in an inverted index. So when you're searching, the search doesn't go against all the text in these documents, but it goes against the inverted um, index. There is other tokenizers where you can just uh, get rid of um, stop words and it just strips off and the uh, is for off these words and then just uh, concentrate on important words. There is other tokenizers that stem words, like if, you're, if you said enjoying, it would just, the ing is just uh, a different form of the word enjoy. So it just takes the base word and then puts it in its inverted index. Um, so when you, are, when you run a search, it doesn't matter if you entered all caps or a combination of uh, lowercase and uppercase. It always, when, when it does a full body text, uh, full, full text search, what it does is your query also goes through an analyzer. So when it goes through the analyzer, it is subjected to the same process that the index was subjected to, and it gets a list of um, words in lowercase that go against the inverted index. So even though you enter your search where a search string um, in um, other case, it does it gets a match and then those results are displayed. And there is two kinds of searches. One is a term search and one is a full text search. With term search, the query string doesn't go through the analyzer. So if you enter something in uppercase, it won't match it because it's an exact match because all your the all terms in your inverted index are stored in lowercase. So um, I can give you an example of that. And if so going through my slides here. So here is where you have a bunch of filters. It goes to the analyzer. This is what analyzer comprises of a tokenizer and then token filters. So when you give it a string, it breaks it um, uh, at the white space, um, and then it gives you those tokens, and those tokens go through the filters, and everything is converted to lowercase. So this is your inverted index. So when you have when you have text fields in your documents, for an index, there is there is one big inverted index that comprises of all the words in all the text fields in all the documents that you have. So when, and when you say okay, when you search for a string, it would look for that particular string, whether it occurs in document one, yes, no. And whichever document has the most matches is the one that bubbles up to the top in terms of um, relevance. And then there's a bunch of analyzers, a standard, simple, English language analyzer, keyword analyzer, stop, where it trims off all those um, trivial words and then white space, pattern, pattern, uh, it token, um, it breaks words into tokens depending on a regex pattern and things like that. Um, if you go here, the way you delete, the way you delete um, an index is just do delete um, product. And if you said get me that, it would say it's not there. Now. I would say put um, a document one
I'll run this and I'll run that, creating two documents. And um, I did update, I did search. Okay, mappings. So mapping is something similar to a schema of a database um, in relational database world. So here, when you create an, an index by default, Elasticsearch is smart enough to see what the data is and then create mappings or properties for those fields. So if you see, if you look at this um, index, the, the properties are that the first, the first field is of type text. And then there's additional fields where in keyword is exact matches. We'll ignore for that, ignore that for now. If I said um, um, uh, You're updating that document. So Unexpected. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So you have this. Now let's go check out the mapping. So you have first, yeah, H. So it was it, it detected that it's a number. By default, all numbers are assigned the data type long. So there is four different types of uh, data types, which is core data types, which include a string, integers, boolean, etc. And then there is complex data types, which is um, arrays, objects. And then there is geodata type, which includes longitude and latitude. And then there is another special data type, which includes attachments and um, IP addresses and things like that. Um, so when you don't specify a mapping when you're creating your index, Elasticsearch does it for you by default. But otherwise, you can just go, say, um, post, product, mapping, and then you can just set um, mappings to the fields that you want to create in your document. The, just like shards, once you have your mapping in place for an index, there's no way you can change that later down the line because you, are, you have your data, it has a type attached to it and all that. If you want to update that mapping, then your search results will be screwed later. So that's that. And OK, I wanted to show you what um, a term search is and a full text search is. So there is this index that I had from before. So I'll go say I want to query, um, um, and this is what I'm looking for, a match, where I say the name will have the word um, lobster. When I say that, so these are a bunch of documents with recipes in them. Um, so the name of that recipe is Lobster Live. And you got a match here. But if I said, because Lobster is capital here, it's not capital here, but still it matched because we have the inverted index with our lowercase and then my search query or the query string also went through an analyzer and it also is lowercase and therefore there's a match. But if I said just do a term um, match, and here I'll say lobster. No, I'll say lobster. I don't get a match because term matches, they, they don't go through the analyzer. And um, you can just do match phrase. When you say match phrase, 
um, it's looking for the exact phrase. So it doesn't look for these um, words um, anywhere in the document. They, these, these words have to be right next to each other. Um, like so. If I did something like this, that wouldn't come up. Oh, that did come up. Mm. So if I did name, Okay, so with match phrases, what you have is match phrase looks for an exact match. I'm not sure why this one came up though. Yeah, yeah. But then match phrase looks for that exact string. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I have to dig deeper into that. But with match phrases, what happens is your string has to match exactly with match all these words they can have they can occur anywhere in the document and there is something called slop okay. so you can have Deleted that, and then let me create a new um, index with a couple documents. So I've added a bunch of documents in this index. Uh, now if I search for a query with a match phrase, a match that is mm, So the words spicy and sauce, if they occur in any of them, you get those results back, and then that is all four documents. Um, so I could have a match phrase like so, and spicy sauce. See, it doesn't occur right next to each other. There is no spicy sauce in any of these. So in that case, what you can do is you can introduce a, a variable or a slot factor called one. That phrase, oh, comma. Phrase doesn't support. Okay, so I need to do this by this where I say. So that's why it's a little difficult to get the hang of it. It's yeah, it takes some getting used to. Right. So I have title, I am, okay, yeah, value. Well, okay. Thank you. After query. Oh, 
Anyway, looking for Match does not support slot. Okay, match brace. So you have this. When I say slot is one, so previously when I just said spicy sauce, I did not get any results back. Now when I said spicy sauce with a slot factor of one, what's happening is slot is when you say one, you're saying that the edit distance between two words in that document is one. So if I swapped sauce and tomato. If I took that word sauce and put it right next to spicy, it, it, it's separated by, these two words are separated from each other by another word. So that is the edit distance of slop. If the edit distance happens to be um, too much, then the relevance factor is decreased. It, it has an inverse relationship. If the edit distance is small, then the relevance goes up. So, um, When, so I could increase the slot to say two now, and I would get even tomato sauce and spicy in brackets. So here, the added distance between spicy and sauce in the phrase spicy tomato sauce is just one. But here in this case, it's not just a matter of sw swapping those two words. So when I do that, it's actually two words. Spicy will go take on um, the position occupied by sauce, and then sauce now has to be moved to the space or the position that spicy had before. So that is two operations. The edit distance is two. So that's the reason, um, as you keep on increasing the slop value, there's more matches, but then again, you also have to take into consideration the relevance. So as you keep increasing that, you would get all documents wherein these words are separated by 100 words but then would that make sense to you? So that's where you need to um, play with it, trial and error, and decide on a number that works for you. And there is another search. So Elasticsearch also does this wherein if you entered um, typos, it fixes it. So you could enter lobster with a, with a zero instead of an O. So in that case, what it does is there's a fuzzy factor the fuzzy factor, what it does is just like slop, how it works on whole words, the fuzzy factor works on uh, individual characters in a word. So um, if that fuzzy factor is, say, one, then that lobster, the zero in the lobster, is uh, substituted for an O, and then it would uh, run the query and get results for lobster correctly. And if, so by default, if there's two, two, two alphabets in a word, the fuzzy factor is zero. That means if you if you had a typo in the word off, if you said full, no matches. But if the word is say three to five um, characters long, then um, the fuzzy factor by default is one. So if you had uh, live, if you wanted to say L V I E, if you said L V I E instead of L I V E, then it would work because that is four characters long. And for anything upwards of five, the, the fuzzy factor is two. So, and again, you could write your own uh, analyzers um, and then uh, tokenizers and all these things and customize things to no end, but then you're sure you have to know what you're doing because there's no point in increasing that fuzziness factor to something in a five word, in a five character word, if you said the fuzziness factor was four, then you come up with gibberish because there's all kinds of words that can go into that one five-letter word where you swap those alphabets for anything. Um, yeah. That's all I think I had. Any questions? And uh, question. Can you have a reference to another document type of thing? Uh, honestly, no, I don't know the answer to that question. And 
things that I forgot are it also handles synonyms where you can swap one word for another, like good and nice are similar semantically. So if you entered good, if there's a document with a word nice in it, it brings that up and things like that. And yeah. So you were asking if you can reference other documents? Yeah. yeah. No, no, there's no like joins or anything of that nature. Okay. So you have to basically norm, uh, denormalize when you are reporting from a relation of data. Exactly. So you have to denormalize and create a whole document. Yeah. You can create multiple, you can create a document with, with, with children. Right? Or, yeah. You can create a document with, you can have a customer with an address. Right. One document. Yes. Right. right. You could you could have as many addresses, I guess. It's right. just it's not a reference to another yeah. address document. It's not like MongoDB or other document databases. 